Jeremiah chapter 1. Let's stand together, please. Jeremiah chapter 1, and we'll look at verses 1 through 6 together. The Bible says, The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests that were in Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, and unto the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. So it's giving the timetable of his ministry. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, this is Jeremiah recording his calling, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. So the idea there is very simple, that God had a purpose and a plan for Jeremiah, even when he was still uh, in his mother's womb before he was ever born. God brought his life into this world and brought his life with a purpose. Then verse 6, Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. And he talked about how he did not feel worthy of this calling, and he struggled with that. And I want to take a look at that a little bit this morning. Heavenly Father, I do pray that you would fill me with thy spirit, and that you would just work in all of our hearts, and that you would just help us to understand the truth of your word, and that we would, we would be able to see how the truth of your word applies to us personally and culturally. And I pray that you'd help us have a productive morning. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Recently in uh, Carnes, Australia, this is just a month or so ago, a 37-year-old woman was arrested in Australia for stabbing to death eight children from the ages of 18 months old up to 15 years. Seven of those children were her own children. One was one of her nieces. We read of things like that in the newspaper. We hear of it in the news report. And we're really speechless. How does a mother murder her seven children and another member of her family 18 months old? And, and we are appalled, we're speechless, we don't even know quite what to say about that because eight innocent children have tragically and senselessly been murdered. It's heartbreaking. It affects us all. But I ask the question, what about 50 million children that have been senselessly and brutally murdered in America since 1973. That's when Roe versus Wade was passed and 50 million children have been murdered since that time. You know, while you are at work tomorrow, 4,000 more innocent people will be submitted to capital punishment. These 4,000 people will have no trial before they're executed. They will have no attorney pleading their cause or their case. They will not even be given the normal human rights that are afforded to a prisoner of war. And of course, I'm talking about 4,000 innocent children that will be aborted tomorrow, approximately. In January 13, 1984, a proclamation by Ronald Reagan was given, and he designated January 22, 1984 as the first National Sanctity of Human Life Day. The date was chosen to coincide with, at that time, the 11th year anniversary of the Roe v. Wade decision that allowed legally uh, children to be aborted. And through the years, that practice was up, up kept by George H.W. Bush. Uh, it was not continued by Bill Clinton. 
And it was continued by George W. Bush, and um, I don't think we have to question whether that's continued today. Personally, I've never had a Sanctity of Life Sunday. The years that I've pastored, I never address this issue, and maybe there's somebody that's saying, here, well, I don't understand why you're, uh, just preach Jesus, man. And let me tell you, if you preach the Bible, you will preach cultural issues. I've never had a Sanctity of Life Sunday, and uh, I, I don't know why that is entirely. Maybe it's because it bothers me. It, it bothers me that we would take some time in a morning service like this and I would have to, as a pastor, a preacher of the Bible, stand up in front of people and say something like this, mothers should not kill their babies. Why should we have to say that? Why should we have to stand up and say fathers that brought babies into this world should not abandon their children? Why do we even have to say that? Why should we have to publicly get up and declare that no human life is worthless, regardless of what their skin color is, regardless of what their age is, regardless of what their disability is? Why do we have to stand up and say, all life is valuable? I guess it bothers me because it reminds me that there are children today that are safely resting in their mother's womb that will not be there tomorrow. It reminds us that there are children just blocks away from our church that today will be slapped and will be cursed and will be abused before nightfall. Sanctity of Life Sunday reminds us that there are elderly men and women sitting in loneliness. And their lives have been declared, as Ebenezer Scrooge would put it, nothing but a surplus population. But what does God say about it? Because again, there are some people who say, well, just stick to preaching Jesus. Well, that's what I plan to do. I plan to preach Jesus, I plan to preach His Word, but I will not ignore what the totality of Genesis to Revelation says, and God has quite a bit to say about life. In Jeremiah chapter 1, a very familiar verse to those that are familiar with this subject. See verse 5, Before I formed thee in the belly, before you were ever conceived, I knew you. Before you ever came forth out of your mother's womb, I had a purpose for your life. In this text, I want to be true because it's not normally the way that I preach, but Jeremiah was approximately 20 years old when God calls him here into the ministry. And, and I can resonate with Jeremiah a little bit as he looked at the task before him. I was 17 years old when God called me into the ministry it's kind of scary to think about that. Uh, this December that has passed now, I've been preaching for 20 years. I, God called me, and when I surrendered at 17, I preached my first sermon two weeks later in a Sunday morning service at a church. It's kind of scary to think for two decades I've been, been uh, preaching. I feel like such a young, attractive, vibrant young man, you know. But I can understand at 17 years old, I, I felt inadequate, you, you know, because I had grown up in church all my life, so I had seen people come and go that said they were going to serve God and they were going to preach, and uh, the, some of them would and many of them would not, and I, I just wanted to, if God was going to call me into that, I wanted to fulfill that calling, and so I, I like Jeremiah, wrestled with that a little bit. Not that I was unwilling to do what God wanted me to do, but could I do what God wanted me to do? And Jeremiah in this text, he, he felt that way. He said, I, I cannot do that. I can't speak. I, I'm only a child. I, I, don't, I don't know that. And he, he looks around him and he sees what God is asking him to do. He sees the wickedness of the culture in which he lives in. And not only does he see that, he sees the weakness in, his, in, in himself. And so he balks at it. He hesitates. I'm not up for that. Don't you know who I am? I know my weaknesses and my failures and my, my inabilities. And I, I look around and I see wicked men and I see our culture. Uh, they're just, what you're asking me to do, I can't do it. 
He was certain he was not the man for the job. But God has an answer for him. And God did that to many men in the Bible. He did it to Moses. Remember, Moses gave every excuse in the book of why he couldn't do what God called him to do, but God always had an answer. I think of men like Amos who said, you're asking me to be a prophet? I'm just a farmer. And God had an answer for him. I think of Saul, the king. He, he, he said, this isn't my thing. And God called him. But the truth in verse 5, I just want you to kind of understand the context the truth in verse 5, that before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. It's the same truth that's poetically expressed in Psalm 139. And I just want to give you this morning, not as long as normally we would be, certainly a different style of message than I normally would preach, but I want to give you this morning three arguments to consider when you're determining the value of life. Three arguments to consider when you're determining the value of life. Number one, I want you to see this, and, and, and we, we need to declare this. We need to get this. Number one, God is the creator of life. God is the creator of life. In Genesis 1.27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. The Bible teaches emphatically and clearly, and by the way, this is a doctrine of the Bible that is under great attack today, I, my heart goes out to our young people because it's something that you are barraged with and people would tell you you're a fool if you believe in the creation account and, and I think that that's very uh, dishonest as far as intellectual, uh, intellectually speaking, but my heart goes out to many of our young people and I hope that you can get this settled in your mind that God is the creator of all life. And we're not going to take a lot of time this morning to go through apologetically as to why it's logical to believe in a creator, although it is, but that's certainly not the, the time frame that I have and the subject that I want to attack. But I want to boldly declare that the Bible clearly states that God is the creator of all life. Well, since God has created life, he protects and he sustains life. In Colossians, it says, for by him were all things created. There it is again. All things were created by him and for him. And, before, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. So God created your life, and God keeps your life going. It is God that causes your heart to beat without you telling it to. It is God that causes your lungs to breathe without you telling your lungs to breathe. It is God that sustains the universe. Could you imagine the chaos that would ensue in this world if the earth stopped spinning for 10 seconds? Do you imagine how hard we'd hit that wall right there? Woo! God keeps all things together and he, they're in his care. He created life and he sustains life. Because God is the giver and sustainer of life, he is also the authority on life. Because God gives life, God is able to take life. I heard a story, uh, an author and, and one that defends the faith, his name is Ravi Zacharias. Some of you may have read some of his books, but he was giving a lecture at a, a college campus. And he was speaking on the subject of faith. But he never brought up on this college campus and university, uh, a major college in our, in our uh, country, he, he did not bring up the subject of abortion. He didn't even mention it. And later, after his series of lectures, he was on the campus radio and people were calling in and talking to him. And an antagonist called in and, and they said, all you people want to do is come here and enforce your agenda. You want to take away our reproductive rights and invade our private lives. And that's all you're at. And, and Robbie Zacharias called a timeout and, and, and the teacher and professor that was with him said, wait a second, we never even discussed this subject. We never even used the word abortion. We never, we never even talked about it. That's not the purpose of his lectures. That's not the purpose of him being here. And the caller began to get angry and said, well then, what is your position on abortion? And this is what he said, and I want to read it to you. He said, as I lecture, often people will claim that God is an evil God because he allows evil in the world. If a plane crashes, sometimes 30 people are killed while 20 live. 
What kind of God would allow some to live and some to die? But when we play God and we determine who should live and who should die, we claim it is our moral right. But God plays God and we call it an immoral act. And he said to the caller, can you justify that to me? Interesting thought, isn't it? We sh it shows the rebellious nature of man as he shakes his finger and fist in the face of God and is angry at God for being the giver, sustainer, and taker of life. And when he acts as God, we are angry at him. Yet when we act as God and decide who should live and who should not live simply based on what is convenient for our lifestyle or appropriate for our finances, whether old people are a drain on our society or babies are an inconvenience to our portfolio and we play God when we are in no position to play God, how do we justify that? Again, I want to say, remember, God is the creator of life. And so the posture of everybody in this room, if you are a born-again person or even if you're not born again and you have come here to worship Jehovah God, you understand this much. The Bible says, I will praise Him for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Since He is the giver and sustainer of life, He deserves our praise. And I'm thankful that God created me with a purpose in mind. Number two, life has a value irregardless of its condition. Life has value irregardless of its condition. Uh, I'm a, I, I know you, you, you've learned by now that I, I'm a well-balanced individual in the sense that uh, I, I'm so uh, academically astute that I, I, I'm a fine connoisseur of poetry. My favorite poet is Shel Silverstein, and second on my list is Dr. Seuss. Look, if you've got to read stories to your kids, you might as well enjoy them, right? And some of you might be familiar with Dr. Seuss. Do you remember that silly little story, Horton Hears a Who? What's funny is that our world celebrates this ideology without following it. In Horton Hears a Who, the main phrase in the whole poem and story is, a person's a person, no matter how small. It's amazing to me how the world has put conditions on life. We have been taught that if it's in the womb, it isn't really life. We have been taught that if it is wanted, then it is life, but if it is not wanted, then it is not life. If we call it a fetus instead of a baby, then it is not life. But if we call it a baby instead of a fetus, then it is life. You know the hypocrisy of our governments? We can abort a fetus, but if a mother who is carrying a baby in her womb is, is assaulted and that baby in her womb dies, then it's a double homicide. I want to declare again, life has value irregardless of its condition. If it's still in the womb, if it's deformed, if it's handicapped, if it's old and expired, as long as God has given and sustains life, it has value. I'm going to give you an illustration that may be somewhat shocking to us. If you understand and know something about American culture, you might be familiar with this name, Dred Scott. Dred Scott. Dred Scott was a, a man who uh, was a, enslaved in, in, in one of the dark times of American history, and he sued the American government for his freedom. Commonly referred to in, in American history as the Dred Scott case. As he sued the American government for his freedom, he lost 7-2. to two. The Supreme Court voted 7-2 to two against his case. Chief Justice Roger Taney was the justice that was given the responsibility to write the decision for the majority. And he, I want to read to you some of what he wrote. He said that they, that 
the, the, the attorneys for Dred Scott abused the Declaration of, the, of Independence for their argument because they used the expression from that document, all men are created equal. And this is what he said. You can look this up. This is in his, his, his declaration, and I quote, It is too clear for dispute that the enslaved African race were not intended to be included and formed no part of the people who framed and adopted this declaration. Now, let me just unpack that really quickly because that should shock all of us that a chief justice would write something like this. Because what he said is, in essence, when it says all men are created equal, that's true, but Dred Scott is not a man. That, that's what he said. He's saying that people have inalienable rights, but as we deny this creation, his inalienable rights, we're not breaking the law because he is not a person. Doesn't that shock you that someone would speak? It angers me. And, and it's embarrassing that we would say in our culture that in, in, American, in America, somebody said that and declared that to be. And it is an embarrassment and a blight on our history. And even today, we're still dealing with some of those ramifications, and we are angered and outraged by this kind of speech. Yet, listen to me. While this man said, well, we're not doing anything wrong, because after all, that's not a man, we are doing the same thing with our unborn. We call them a fetus. And it makes us feel better. And I'm telling you, it is just as wrong and immoral and hypocritical as what this man said in his declaration. Just because they said that a man with black skin wasn't a man doesn't mean they were right. And let me tell you, just because they say a baby in a womb is a fetus and not a person does not mean that they are right. And by the way, we must not overlook those who have challenges in this life. Let's follow the example of our Lord. Jesus showed special concern for the lame. He showed special concern for the blind, the lepers. Why is that? Because as the creator and sustainer of life, he valued that life. And is it not troubling to you today that many doctors will come to a mother who is carrying life in her womb and they will say because of technology and the use of testing and ultrasounds and other, other medical uh, advancements, they will say this life that is in your womb is not what they deem perfect life and they will suggest and pressure and encourage them to take that life and in that life because in their mind it is not ideal life. Shocking. Can I go in f further and say, wicked? Do any of you ever get angry when you're, uh, I could have stopped there. Somebody's like, yeah, I get angry all the time. <laughs> any of you ever get angry when you go to a shopping mall and you can't find a, a, a parking space? Yeah, that's frustrating, isn't it? And you drive around and around and around, and then, and then some idiot's going the wrong way. Doesn't that bother you? You know, all the parking spaces are angled a certain way, and there's a big white arrow, and somebody's going the wrong way. That's aggravating. And then you finally find a spot way in the back, and you, you get in there, and you get out, and you're walking up, and somebody zips in and parks right in a handicapped spot. And you look in that handicapped spot, and they don't have a handicapped license plate, they don't have a handicap tag in there. They just jump out of their vehicle and with a spring in their step, walk right in the store. Doesn't that just make you spit and mad? Anybody ever seen that and got angry about that? Sure. Because we, now nobody in this room gets angry because they have designated spaces for people who are handicapped and have trouble walking and moving around. We're more than happy to give a close spot to somebody right up front that needs it but oh boy we get man, look at that guy I'm, i'll handicap him yeah <laughs> right we kind of feel that way why is that well it's it, there's something kind of inside of us isn't there that wants to wants to defend and to protect and accommodate somebody who's 
He was handicapped. Not, not in a pity way. Not in a manufactured, foolish, pitied way. But we just, there's something humane inside of us that wants to look out for somebody that needs a little bit of looking after. Then pray tell why we don't do that for our innocent little children. Why is it we protect and defend the accom- uh, and accommodate the handicapped, but when a child is deemed less than perfect, the parents are encouraged to eliminate it? Or should I say murder it? Let me give you thirdly, and lastly, and this is why this is so important. Once life begins, it has an eternal existence. You understand that our earthly life here is simply a prelude into eternity? You and I, we're just playing the prelude. And one day we'll be ushered into eternity. Hebrews 9.27 says this, And it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. I'm telling you, listen to me, as we come to a conclusion, all life will exist forever. The Bible speaks of eternal life. There are some that will live forever in heaven. But the Bible also speaks of eternal death. There are some that will exist forever in hell. That's why life is so important. That's why life is so valuable. It is because it is God's prized, it's God's prized creation. It is eternal in its existence. Let me give you an example or an illustration. My son Mark, he's our youngest and all of my children, man, we just, just love our children, of course. Children are such a blessing in our home. Uh, but Mark, our youngest, all of my children bring so much joy. But Mark, he brings a lot of laughter and joy to our family. And here recently, uh, he, he made me a drawing. Uh, this is a drawing of, of Brutus. Brutus is the mascot for Ohio State. <laughs> and uh, a buckeye is a nut. It, it's, it's, it, it's like a walnut. There's a certain buckeye tree, and it, it's like a walnut. And, it, and it, it looks, they call it a buckeye because it looks like the eye of a deer. It's very black like that or dark, deep, dark brown. And so Brutus' head is a buckeye. And he's a goofy-looking guy, I know, but I'm from Ohio, and I love Ohio State, and we like Bruce, and so he wanted to make something for Dad, and Dad likes Ohio State, and so he made Brutus the Buckeye. You can clearly look at this and see that my six-year-old son put a lot of time in this. I mean, he uh, went after to find out what Brutus looks like, and of course, I'm raising my children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, so he knows what Brutus looks like, and he's a good Ohio State fan. Because I want him to grow up and have the blessing of God on his life. And all people that want the blessing of God on their life root for Ohio State. Amen, Brother Dale? That's right. So he, he figured out what Brutus looks like, you know, and that kind of thing. And you can see this wasn't just done on a single 8 and a half by 11 sheet of paper. He glued several pieces. He cut them out. He designed it. He made his little legs and his arms. And he glued them together. And he... He colored them, and when he was complete with his creation, he was so excited. Dad, I got something for you. Well, you're going to love it. Well, what is it, man? Is it a million bucks? No, it's better. <laughs> and man, he goes running off to his room, and I mean, he comes in. I mean, this thing's about as tall as he is, and he's got it back there. And man, he comes running up. Daddy! Now, what would you think if I, if I took it and I held it after he'd worked so hard? And as he was, as he was working on it, he, he was thinking of his dad. Now, proud his dad would be that I made my dad something my dad enjoys and my dad likes. My dad likes the Buckeyes and I, I, I want my dad to know that I love him. What, what, what would you think if I, if I said, wow.
Now don't get too upset at me. It's been hanging on my fridge for a couple months now. <laughs> and you can't keep everything. And I asked him if that would be all right before I did that. <laughs> but I wanted to shock you a little. Oh, you can't, you shouldn't do that. Well, let's just really be, can we be really honest? That's really not worth anything. Some scrap paper, a little bit of Elmer's glue and some Crayola markers. Monetarily, absolutely no value. Sentimentally, has value. But he, Mark created that. And to him, it's very, very important. God creates life. And I pulled his arm off and pulled his leg up. And you know, we, we oftentimes do surgically aborted, aborted children. We burn them. We maim them. We cut them. We suck their brains out and throw them in garbage cans. Oh, you're just trying to be a shock and awe kind of... Pre no, no, I'm just trying to be real. And we take what God has valued more than anything and right in front of Him just tear it up? Wow. But let's be very clear. The reason life has such great value is because... It exists forever. It is God's prized creation. So let me conclude with this. Violence isn't the solution. And I think people that would blow up an abortion clinic or shoot a doctor are just as equally wrong and should be persecuted to the nth degree. But while violence isn't the solution, the opposite problem is apathy, and I say that it's just as wrong. So what can we do? Let me throw out a few things real quick and we're done. Number one, teach morality in the home and in the church. Can I say to those of you that have children in your home that are growing up, you ought to have a, you ought to have a talk to them about the birds and the bees as soon as it's appropriate. You see, our issue has never been with sex education in the school. The problem is sex education in the school, those, those people are not qualified to talk about morality there. You ought to be talking about it in your home. And because of the culture in which we live in, sometimes we have to address it and talk about it in our pulpit, and in our classrooms. Number two, have compassion for the unwed mother. Look, look if somebody comes into our church... You know, we don't want to be guilty of treating them with such disdain and contempt. Listen, I'm against having children out of wedlock. I'm just going to tell you that right now. And I don't mind saying it, and somebody should say amen. You know, we're, we're, the Bible is opposed to that. But if somebody has a child out of wedlock, they still ought to find love and grace here. And see, part of the problem is, is we've treated somebody with such embarrassment and shame about that, and not that they shouldn't be ashamed and guilty about their sin, but don't drive somebody to try and cover their sin by murdering their baby. You know, what's done is done. What's in the past is in the past. And we're going to love moving forward because this life is very, very valuable to God. And really, we need to do what we can do to have a network of support for the unwed mother. How about this? Thirdly, Speak against abortion without apology. Because I don't know if you were uncomfortable this morning. I hope you're not. But we, we shouldn't be uncomfortable about in our workplace, our schoolhouse, our homes, speaking out about this with authority. Number four, we need to vote accordingly. And there's a lot of blah, 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 blah going on about who the candidate is going to be and this and that. Listen, I'm not Democrat or Republican, independent, anybody in between or on any fringe. You ought to vote accordingly. And if you say you believe a, you're opposed to is it, well, it doesn't matter. They ain't going to change the laws anyway. Well, it matters to my conscience. You trying to tell me who to vote for? You vote for who you want to vote for. I am telling you this, that as far as I'm concerned, I will not knowingly vote for somebody that supports abortion. 
Number five, pray for God to have mercy. Last night, I sat with one of my children and we read the Bible together. We read Genesis 18 together. And in Genesis 18, God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham said, would you spare Sodom and Gomorrah for the sake of 50 righteous people? God said, sure. And they looked for 50 righteous. They couldn't find them. How about 45? Okay. How about 40? How about 20? And Abraham kept pleading with God, please have mercy on Sodom and Gomorrah. You know what? I look around this room. There's more than 50 people in this room. 50 people who are saved and have righteous souls before God, justified souls. I think it would be a prayer that we ought to pray, maybe more often than we do. God, will you spare our nation? Will you have mercy on us? Because there's still, there's still a church here that loves you. And there's still a church here that values life. And I know our, our country has passed legislation that's wrong. And I know we've done wrong, and I know a lot of people have suffered before, but please, God, you are a merciful God. Please have mercy on us. We ought to pray for that for America. Well, let me ask you a few questions and we're done. Here's a big question. We said all life will exist somewhere. What about your life? Where will you spend your eternal existence? Will it be in heaven? Will it be in the place of judgment that we call hell? Number two, how valuable is life to you? How valuable is life to you? One quick story and we're done. Brother Raphael, our assistant pastor, helps with our Spanish you know, he's had a little bit of trouble with his baby being born prematurely and having some difficulty and such. I applaud a young man like Brother Raphael when the doctor came in and basically said, this baby, health problems are so bad, probably going to have a terrible quality of life. And the doctor encouraged them and even in some ways pressured them to end their baby's life. Brother Raphael weighed their medical advice prayed about it, talked to his wife, and came back to the doctor and said, you know, doctor, we're going to keep this baby. We're going to do everything we can to keep this baby alive. And I love what he said to the doctor. He said this, and I would appreciate you if you would never bring this subject up to me again. We don't want to discuss it with you. We don't want to talk about it any further. As long as God gives our baby life, we will do what we can to help him. How valuable is life to you? How valuable? 